Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, President of the Future of Freedom Foundation, and this is this week's issue of The Libertarian Angle, the show that brings you the libertarian perspective on the burning issues of the day. And I'm joined as I am every week by my co-host, Richard Ebeling, who's a professor of economics at the Citadel. Richard, good to see you again. Good to see you. Always glad to be back with you and our viewers and listeners. Yeah, likewise. And I thought we would discuss the Second Amendment, gun rights, uh, you know, with Trump in office, has kind of been an interesting phenomenon uh, that gun sales have, have plummeted since he was elected and were skyrocketing when people thought that Hillary Clinton was going to be in office. Uh, that's not to say that the threat of gun control and gun confiscation is eliminated, uh, because, of course, you never know what Donald Trump's going to do, and he does have some leftist perspectives. So I thought it's important that we go back and we reaffirm fundamental principles of, of gun ownership. So let me, let me begin with a little summary of the libertarian position on gun rights, and then I'll, I'll pass it over to you. Um, but our position as libertarians is very simple, that you have the right to, to own guns. This is a matter of just simply the right of human beings. When Jefferson talked about every single human being being endowed with certain fundamental, natural, God-given rights. Among these are the right to own property. That's what private property is all about. And guns, of course, are part of private property. Uh, now, that's, so that's the fundamental principle. It's a part of freedom, the freedom to own private, private things. There's another factor here, and that's the right to defend yourself against people who would take away your rights, destroy your rights, uh, murderers and rapists and, and thieves and burglars into your house and so forth. You have a right to defend yourself against these people. And that um, often means using deadly force or threatening the use of deadly force. Uh, so we, we libertarians have often argued that the right to own guns is part of the right of self-defense, both in a moral sense and a legal sense. And finally, the, the third rationale is the one that I think was really behind the Second Amendment, and that is the right to resist tyranny. Uh, that the, the Second Amendment and the right to own guns is, is like an insurance policy. It's, it's to insure against the prospect of tyranny in your own country, and that if tyranny were to happen, then it serves as a way for people to resist that tyranny, overthrow the tyranny, as Jefferson said, everybody's got a right to do, and to install new government that is consistent with the protection of the rights and liberties of the people. So on that note, Richard, let me pass it over to you and see what you think about this issue. Well, let me sort of reiterate uh, some of the points that you just made, and perhaps add a, a few historical examples, if I may. Uh, unless you are an absolute and sincere and uncompromising pacifist, you believe that each individual has a right to self-defend. That is, if someone uh, uses uh, or clearly eminently is threatening uh, the use of violence against oneself or one's family, most everyone recognizes, both by reason and almost the instinctual response uh, of self-defense. Now, we think that it is all right, I presume, that we can defend ourselves by putting up our hands to block an attack. Um, that is often insufficient, so we might throw our own punch to try to deter the aggressor. We also, I think, accept the fact that it is all right to pick up, let's say, uh, a, a poker in the fireplace or, or, or a piece of wood or a candle, a candelabra uh, uh, or whatever to, uh, to be a counter weapon now, can any of these, including, for example, like a knife, a kitchen knife, uh, can these do physical harm to the aggressor? Yes. Uh, it could injure him or even kill them. Uh, we also know that whether it be the poker in the fireplace or the kitchen knife uh, or, or, or the two-by-four uh, piece of wood, all of those besides self-defense could be used as aggression. But we do not deny the right of individuals to use such objects in self-defense, even with the realization that they could be used for aggressive purposes as well. Now, sometimes that is still insufficient, particularly if one is being threatened by more than one attacker at a time. And therefore, there has developed, uh, historically, uh, that would be a history of technology, these other forms of weapons, including firearms. 
uh, whether it be a pistol or a rifle of one type or another. Now, surely, each one of us, regardless of uh, legal niceties, if someone was approaching us or was literally and physically attacking us or our immediate family members, and we considered that ourselves or our family members were threatened with eminent real bodily harm or even death, there's very few of us who would have any qualms if there was a gun there and we felt that was the only means to stop the aggressor from picking up that firearm and presuming one was how to just even use it to do so to protect ourselves and our loved ones. That, that, now, is it true that firearms can also be used in an aggressive fashion? Yes. Uh, governments often do in war, and even private individuals do in acts of uh, aggression against life and property of their fellow human beings. But merely because they can be used for aggressive purposes does not presume that individuals should not have the right to use those means and methods that seem most necessary in those circumstances for their own self-defense. Now, if one accepts that principle, then it is logical to say that it, out of the right of preserving one's own life from eminent and other types of threats, that one has a right to self-defense with any means necessary uh, in the eyes of uh, an objective observer. Now, why do I say that objective observer? Uh, if one reads John Locke, John Locke says everybody has a natural right of self-defense. In the state of nature, before government, everyone has a right of self-defense. But we also recognize that sometimes people in the passion of the moment may use excessive force in an act of self-defense. But the principle is, is, and therefore that's the basis of government, an impartial judge, an impartial enforcer of the law, the policeman. But, it, but it's argued that if a person has to do an act of self-defense, there is a legal inquiry. Was this an aggression? Was the person's life really eminently threatened? Is it reasonable that he used the form and the degree of force justifiable that any, quote, reasonable man would consider the objective observer? And if so, it is a legitimate use of the weapon to protect oneself. Now, those are the fundamental principles of, of just being a human being unless you place no value or think no one has a right to their life. Now, the other element of this, as you were pointing out towards the end of, of your, your comments, is, is, is government. The fact is, is that throughout history, no matter how violent and cruel uh, and deadly private gangs or private individuals have been, the serial killer, uh, the, the gang, the, the most tyrannical mass murderer in human history has always been government. Whatever the government is called, whether it's called a tribe, whether it's called a monarchy, whether it's called a, a socialist or fascist dictatorship, or even a democracy. The fact is that government has been the most dangerous and serious and largest threat to human life and, and, and property. So the Founding Fathers, in my opinion, as you were suggesting in their wisdom, suggested that government, that individuals should have the right of self-defense, both surely against foreign aggressors, right, support of national defense if an aggressor came abroad, uh, but also to, to as an ultimate and final and desperate means of defending one's liberty and life and self That is the second private protection and an ultimate weapon if in desperate and extreme circumstances your own government became the greatest threat to your life and liberty rather than just other private individuals. Now, historically, individuals with the ability to do this have been able to ward off, at least for a period of time, far more superior power. Let me just use two examples from uh, Second World War and both Poland. In 1943, the Nazis decided to clear the Jewish ghetto out of Warsaw. Uh, and there were only a few thousand people left the ghetto, and he had just been sent off to concentration camps earlier to their death. And the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto got wind of this. They had been collecting some crude and, and rude and, and basic armaments. They got a very, very limited amount from the Polish nationalist underground. And they held off the Nazis who were attempting to get, send in the full military force in the ghetto and clear it out and seizing everyone to send them to these camps. 
for weeks, weeks, with a handful of weaponry against the entire force of the Nazi and Gestapo garrison in Warsaw, Poland. The next year, in 1944, the Soviet army is approaching Warsaw. The Polish underground decides to try to liberate Warsaw by itself. They lost, unfortunately, that the Nazis raised Warsaw. But they were able for weeks to hold off the entire Nazi military force in a desperate attempt to save their lives. Now, one can say, but look, at the end of the day, the Jews still lost in the Warsaw Ghetto or the Nazis ended up obliterating Warsaw and in, in, in in, in crushing the, the, the Polish uh, underground. That is true. But it doesn't change the fact that, that it shows that in certain circumstances, the ability to have the, the, the means of defending yourself can ward off even powerful and aggressive and cruel governments. If enough people are armed and enough people believe in these things. Tyrants can be overthrown have been overthrown, and it has given breathing space, space and opportunity to resist it. One other example from our own history, and this is going to be dear to your heart, Jacob, but you're from Texas, the Alamo. Here are these handful of little over 100 uh, volunteers held off Santa Ana's much more larger army for a period of time. And yes, they sacrificed their lives, they lost their lives, except for a handful of women and children. But the fact is, is that it gave the, the Texas uh, freedom, the opportunity to bolster and prepare their forces to eventually be, be victorious uh, against, uh, against the Mexican army. And that was the forming of a volunteer force under an emerging Texas freedom movement. So all of these are just where it does matter that individuals have the ability to protect themselves not only against the aggressions of private individuals, but the threats of powerful governments as well. Yeah, let me re um, return to your to your first point about uh, the use of deadly force. I mean, one of the reasons that I've always felt that government was important was that I felt you always needed to have a, a monopoly institution in society to set forth the conditions as to when deadly force would be used. Uh, for example, if, uh, if somebody is caught stealing a television set from your house, let's say they, they go into your house and they're now putting it into their car, into your, into their car outside the house, if you go out and kill them, uh, in order to save your television set from being stolen, the state will prosecute you for murder because they have set forth the guidelines that say property is not as valuable as life. And that in this instance, if, if, it's, a, if it's a question of having to kill him to save your television set, you let him have the television set and let the cops go and find him. Uh, I, I think that's an, that's an important attribute to a, to a free society where nobody can just make up their own rules as to the use of deadly force. Uh, because, you know, let's say a, a kid or let's say a housewife is in a grocery store and pulls a grape uh, from the fruit bin and puts it in her mouth and eats it. Well, we don't want the store owner to be able to shoot her for stealing from him. As a society, we would say, hey, it's just, it's just going a little bit too far to use deadly force. But as you were pointing out, there are instances where deadly force is necessary. When a woman is being raped, uh, deadly force is, is clearly warranted, and the gun is the great equalizer. You know, if a woman who's 5'5 and weighs 110 pounds or so is being raped by a guy who's 6 feet, uh, 200 pounds, she doesn't have a chance to resist that. But with a gun, she certainly does. I mean, that, that then becomes the great equalizer where she can put the guy down. And that's her right. I mean, it's her right to defend her body from this aggressor. And if it comes to the use of deadly force, she has the right to use deadly force. And it's the same thing with somebody trying to murder you, somebody that you find inside your house in the middle of the night or the middle of the day. You have a right in most states to, to kill them. 
shoot them without any questions asked. Uh, nobody's going to second guess your, ju your judgment if somebody is inside your house because it is presumed that they're going to be doing something very, very bad to you. Uh, so that's, that's the, the, one of the principal ideas of, of gun ownership is this right of self-defense. Uh, now, on the other thing, on the Second Amendment, I, I think it's important to point out that when people say, well, look, let's look at the phrasing of the Second Amendment. Let's see if it really gives people unfettered right to own guns because it does say something about a well-regulated militia and maybe the founders were talking about the National Guard or something like that. It's important that we first keep in mind that the Bill of Rights really was unnecessary to the, to the fulfillment of individual rights, that the Constitution sets up a government of limited powers. It does not set up a government that gives anybody any rights. The framers understood that rights ad adhere naturally in a person. Uh, they, they don't need, nobody needs a constitution to say, these are your rights. Instead, if we examine the constitution carefully, it says that these are the powers of government. And, and so it's, it's an enumerated powers uh, constitution. If a power isn't delegated to the government, then the government simply cannot uh, exercise it. So since the Constitution does not give the government the power, the authority to confiscate guns, to regulate guns, then it simply doesn't have it. So then why was the Bill of Rights enacted then? Well, it was because people still didn't trust the government. I mean, they weren't really enthusiastic about the Constitution. They, in fact, they said, the American people at that time said, look, uh, if, if we're going to accept this new government that you're calling into existence, because they thought the Constitutional Convention was just going to amend the Articles of Confederation, which provided for a very weak government. In fact, the federal government, a lot of people don't realize, through the whole 10 years of the Articles of Confederation, uh, didn't even have the power to tax people. And so people say, if, if we're going to accept this new government you're calling into existence, we want to make sure. We don't want to rely just on the enumerated powers doctrine. We want express restrictions on power, on the power of their own government officials. And that's where the First Amendment comes in, is it? Look, you people in this federal government, you will not control what we read, what we write, what we publish, wh how we worship, whether we worship. And the Second Amendment, which I think really should have gone first, because without the Second Amendment, the, the other ones really become meaningless. Uh, you, you've got to have teeth and the ability to keep government in check and that's what the Second Amendment does, uh, that the Second Amendment was simply a confirmation of that, the same type of thing. We don't trust you. We don't trust just the enumerated doctrine, powers doctrine. We want to make it real clear. You don't have the authority to take away our guns. And then, of course, to fortify this concept that government is capable of doing very bad things to people, they ensure the enactment of the Fourth, Fifth, Sixth, and Eighth Amendments that said, if you're planning on doing anything bad to the citizenry, here's the procedure you're going to have to follow. Due process of law, trial by jury, right to counsel, and other procedural uh, aspects, the right to habeas corpus, which was in the, in the initial, in the Constitution itself. So they recognized in this document, in the Bill of Rights, that governments do very bad things to people, especially people's own governments and that the Second Amendment was a way to ensure against that type of tyranny. And l let me say one final thing, Richard, to add to the examples that you've already used. The British colonists on July 4th, 1776, and that's what they were. They were British colonists. They were not Americans. When they signed that Declaration of Independence, they were taking up arms, not against some foreign government. They were taking up arms against their very own government. And what precipitated them doing that was the government, their own government's attempt to seize their own gun, their, their, the people's guns at Concord and Lexington. That's what was the spark that triggered the revolution because people understood at that time, if you let government take away our guns, then we have no, no means by which to violently resist the tyranny that they're imposing on us. Right. And, see, and just to... Uh, re refine this last point that, that you've just made about the American Revolution. You know, all of us tend to remember the, the famous line, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, 
Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in the Declaration of Independence. But then what, what, what is then said after that? Well, basically, after the people have attempted to present their grievances to the government uh, and concerning violations of their rights, and after many such appeals, uh, the political power refuses to, to undertake any, any uh, 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 corrections. It then says that the people then have a right to abolish that government and form a new government that will secure their liberties. Abolish that government? Now, since no government just says, well, gee, I guess you don't want us anymore. Uh, we're closing our doors today. No. The established government, viewing itself as a legitimate authority, as also the source of its own corruption and plunder, most likely, will resist any attempt of the people to refuse obedience. How then do the people abolish that government, other than the way that the colonists did, taking up arms as individuals, as guerrilla forces, and as an organized force under the leadership of General George Washington? All of that would have been impossible. We would not be here today uh, as citizens of a United States uh, with whatever liberties that we still preciously have and want to preserve and restore to a greater extent if it wasn't for the fact that those colonists, as you directly point, right, point out as, the, as, a, as an example from our own heritage, took up their arms and overthrew a government that they viewed as oppressive, uh, taxation without representation, uh, violation of their economic freedoms through the mercantilist controls and planning of the time, and so on. All of this were, were, were the oppressions that they took up arms to overthrow uh, and, and replace. They could not have done that. They would not be a United States of America today if men had not had arms and been willing to, to use them to overthrow what they were defining as an oppressive government. That is, that they, they, America is based upon the, the right of gun ownership and its use in extreme circumstances against an oppressive government. Yeah, and your use of the, of the Alamo as an example is a very interesting one, and, and it, it, it's near and dear to my heart because, as you know, I'm a native Texan. And when I was growing up and I would visit the Alamo and, and then I read, I, I saw the movie with John Wayne and Richard Widmark uh, called The Alamo, I, it always intrigued me as to why people stayed there. I mean, uh, according to the movie, uh, Bowie was saying, hey, let's get out of here. Let's, uh, let's engage in a bunch of ambushes. Uh, but but let's not stay here. We're farly out, far outnumbered. There's no way we can beat uh, Santa Ana's army unless unless Sam Houston sends aid, which was not very likely. So in a sense, every guy in there knew he was going to die, and and still had a chance to escape, and yet he stayed. And that that always intrigued me as a kid. Is, is why did they do this? Well, the reason is because it seems to me sometimes human beings get to a point where they don't want to run anymore. I mean, they, 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 they'd rather go down fighting against an oppressive regime. And um, running just becomes a, a less savory option. Well, I think that's what drives people when they have guns and they take up arms. I mean, Jefferson points out in the, Revolu in the Declaration that revolutions can be very, very deadly affairs. I mean, we all know that, a lot of death and destruction. And so people don't choose the, the violent overthrow, the violent abolition of government lightly. Uh, it's only when the government becomes so tyrannical that people say, enough is enough. Uh, but when they get to that point, if they lack the means to do that, then they have but one choice, and that is to submit to the rapes, to the torture, to the brutality, to the executions, to the assassinations. And this was brilliantly uh, expressed in a, in a legal case called uh, Silvera versus Lockyer. I think it's S-I-L-V-E-I-R-A versus L-O-C-K-Y-E-R. Find it, you can find it on the internet. Google Judge Kozinski's dissent in that case. It's just an absolutely brilliant exposition of what was guiding the Founding Fathers with respect to the Second Amendment. What Kaczynski says is, look, you know, when you relinquish your guns to the government, you can only make that mistake only once. Because once you do it, 
and the tyranny then happens and your 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 spouses are being rounded up and raped and tortured and murdered that you don't have the means to resist anymore so it's it's a very grave mistake it's a make it's a mistake you don't you can only make once because at that point when that starts to happen it's impossible to say well we've made a mistake would you please give us our guns back at that point it's too late and that's the thing that every american needs to keep in mind that it that as he sees gun control in places like germany or japan he has to keep in mind that okay as long as they've got a nice government everything's fine but when the tyrant reaches the reins of power the american has an option that these other people don't have the american has the right to resist and that's a factor that every would-be tyrant has to factor in his decision making when he's making his rules and regulations and edicts when he's in power here in this country right of course the, the a decision to take up arms against one's own government has to be viewed as the last recourse not only because of the violence and death that will be set in its wake uh, besides the tyranny that has led people to make those decisions that have preceded the t taking up of arms. But there's also the fact that history has fill is filled with unintended consequences. Uh, revolutions and rebellions that have led to the, the great terror during uh, the, the French Revolution or, or, or the, uh, the, the, the breakup of a China in 1911 following the, the Chinese Revolution of overthrowing a Manchu dynasty or the, the abdication of the Tsar in wartime, World War I wartime uh, Russia, which then set the stage for the Bolsheviks and, and the communist episode. So taking up arms and opposing a government and therefore shattering the institutions with no certainty exactly what will follow it uh, based upon one's hopes and dreams makes always such resistance and taking up of arms uh, a cautious, deliberative, thoughtful and last resort as, as a method when all other means of redress against an oppressive government have failed, but truly as a final defense against a tyrant. There must be the idea that you can resist the, the, the dictator and his agents. Otherwise, there is no avenue to prevent the oppressor from perpetuating his oppression. Yeah, and, and people will suggest, oh, well, this would never happen in the United States. That's just impossible. And therefore, people don't really need guns to protect themselves against a contingency that would never happen. Well, that's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, you've got a government here that trained uh, the Shah of Iran's tyr tyrannical force called the Sabak, which was a brutal domestic Gestapo type agency that tortured people, indefinitely detained them, executed them. I mean, they were so tyrannical that the Iranian people finally revolted in 1979 against the CIA installed Shah. Uh, but the CIA trained the Savak to do these kind of things. They partnered with them. And, uh, and then, of course, the aftermath of that is that the, the the Iranian people unfortunately ended up with an even worse dictatorship with the Ayatollah and the theocrats. I mean, that's all, of course, rooted in the, in the 1953 CIA regime change operation, which is a separate subject. But then if we look at the, at the CIA's regime change operation in Chile in 73, they were helping Pinochet establish a domestic Gestapo called Dina that engaged in a reign of terror that is phenomenal. I mean, he rounded up some 50 or 60,000 innocent people. He tortured most of them. He killed around three or 4,000 of them. And this was all with the full support of the U.S. government. So, and why did the U.S. government do this? Because they believed it was important to do it. So for somebody to suggest that they wouldn't do it here is nonsense. If they believed it was important to do it here, if they were ordered to do it here, you can rest assured that the troops in the CIA would follow those orders uh, faithfully. And so, again, it's an insurance policy. The widespread gun ownership, even if, uh, if a single person doesn't own guns, even if a family says, look, we don't believe in guns, fine. But you are m more safe because everybody around you own guns. You're safer because in a restaurant, uh, if some mass murderer comes in, you've got people there ready to shoot them uh, to protect you who, who may be disarmed. And in the event of a, of a tyrannical, oppressive government coming into power, 
you're better off if other people own guns because they then have the means to resist that tyranny, which benefits everyone. And again, it's also an insurance policy against would-be tyrants who are going to think twice before they do something when they know that everybody's armed and able to resist. Right. The, the, the other contradiction, for even hypocrisy, is that uh, when European governments in particular that have often stringent anti-gun ownership laws on the books, and uh, many in the United States, mostly uh, on the left, but sometimes uh, in the Republican Party too, who, who call for either restrictions on gun ownership or ownership at all. Uh, the fact is, how then do you justify the United States government? We're not talking about the ethics of intervention. I'm just talking about their action here, Jacob. How do you then justify the United States arming resistance civilians to oppose an oppressive government. Right? Are we not arming resistance forces in Syria? Are these not people rising up against the rebellion of the Assad regime and the Assad family in Syria? Well, what basic, do, do, are you saying they have a right to bear arms that you're supplying them with to oppose an oppressor? Well, I think you're in a contradiction here if you deny the liberty of your own citizens as an ultimate, hopefully never necessary precaution to have the right to bear arms here at home as well. Yeah, that's a great point. I hadn't really thought about that one. That's awesome. Uh, on that great note, Richard, we got to wrap up. We're out of time. Uh, as always, I greatly enjoyed it, and uh, I look forward to talking to you next week again. And it was great, and thank you, viewers and listeners, for sharing your time with us. Yep, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you all next week.